Hope for over 20 years. Paula trained in political documentary with Banner Theatre, touring with them between 94 and 98. And on her return to Corby, her hometown, she made a conscious decision to use theatre as a form of dialogue to bring to light and resolve community concern. 2006, her play Women of Steel became a film and a book, receiving critical acclaim as an accessible and authoritative living history of the town, which was shaped by the steel industry. Um, and during lockdown, Paul has self-published three books of poetry about local woodland. Okay, so I'm now going to put your um, slides up, Paula. Okay. And there they are. Lovely. And just to help the bandwidth, Brian, shall we turn off our videos? Um, because it's a bit of echo, I've got. So, yeah. All right, Paula, over to you. Right. So, um, does that mean, Sonia, that the slides are on the, if, you know, people watching are watching the slides and not me at the moment because they, the slides don't come in until I do my reading. So all I've got is. Uh, sure, you, you tell me when you want them up then and I'll, I'll okay, keep them then. until you're ready. Off you go. All right, then. thank you. So. Well, uh, welcome. I'm, I'm really glad that you invited me to take part, Sonia. And uh, I watched the uh, opening address this morning and realised I might have come at this at a, a different way than most people because I'm not coming at it as an academic. Um, but never mind, I'll do I'll do what I plan to do. And um, since you started by reading that bit from my biography, I don't need to repeat that. So instead, I'm just going to extemporise for a moment. Um, following on from what Jan said, because what I haven't talked about anywhere is my own background. Um, my dad uh, came to Corby um, with the intention of helping to build a new town. Um, it was a new town back then. I was born a year after he arrived in 56. And really, I think I've just followed in his footsteps uh, in trying to develop the art in this town, but also I founded a women's centre um, with my sister and we ran that for 20 years. Um, and, you know, we, we also opened a refuge. So I've been very, very involved in building the town. And um, apart from a, a 10 year period where I lived and worked abroad, um, I have made my life uh, here in Corby. Um, also, this business that's come up several times today about the welfare state, I'm, I'm five years probably, you know, I'm slightly, uh, slightly younger. The 11th plus was abolished the year I went to do it, but we were allowed to be um, suggested as, you know, our heads at the primary school suggested who they thought should go to the grammar school. So I was one of the fortunate ones that went to Kingswood Grammar. And I also want to say that I'm very fortunate to have had uh, a granny who was a founder member of the Communist Party trying to get things changed in Manchester, uh, which is where my family are from, and my dad as well. And she used to say, culture, leisure, travel and education are not the, uh, do not belong to the middle classes. They are everybody's birthright. And when you've got a granny telling you that all the time, and you've got a dad who says, don't let anybody ever treat you as a second class citizen on account of being a woman, you're as good as any man, if not better. Um, you grow up with a certain attitude to life and self-esteem inbuilt, which I have to say has stood me in good stead. And I'm very, uh, you know, I, I, I meet women all the time who never got those messages. So um, it just shows how much what you hear in the house uh, affects you. And uh, we got the Daily Worker. So there you go. Um, it became the Morning Star eventually. So I always knew that there were two sides to the way the world was being reported. Um, and that's, I think, where I come in, actually, because when I joined uh, Banner Theatre, it was because I'd heard Tony Benn speaking and I'd been in a political theatre company in Holland and it was called Baraud. Baraud means to stir up. And we toured pieces about Nicaragua and El Salvador. But I was getting so depressed at what was happening in Corby in 94 and I didn't know what the political theatre networks were in this country. And I went to listen to Tony Benn speaking in Corby and Banner Theatre performed afterwards. And by some miracle, they um, had put an advert in 
for um, a new um, musician stroke performer. And I spoke to them afterwards and I'd missed the closing date, but they let me submit. And I was taken on to tour in Sweatshop, which had researched in Corby. So there we go. They'd come to Corby, they'd looked at the factory um, exploitative practices here in this town and written them into the play. And uh, that, that was me, you know, literally a, a way I was kind of drawn into the political theatre network. And that's where I learned in the tradition of Ewan McCall and Joan Littlewood, it goes right the way back because in the early days of Banner Theatre, the um, actuality was um, put together from listening to people and choosing their words and making fabulous, um, you know, backdrops and scripts and sound montages from the spoken word, the vernacular, the way working class people express themselves and talk about their lives. So that's the kind of world that I found myself in, um, touring the trade union base of um, not just not just here, we went over to Denmark and Ireland as well, but main, mainly up and down the breadth of the United Kingdom. And um, it was wonderful, but I began to get frustrated that I didn't know if it was having any impact. We, we went to the Timex um, uh, workers in, in Dundee when they were on strike. They were mentioned in the play. Some of them came to watch the performance, but they'd never been to the theatre before. And we would converted a working men's club into a theatre. And it was really great to see them get so inspired by the sort of theatre we were doing. And I decided I wanted to do that in a place where I could see the impact. So I returned to Corby and I started a youth theatre group and began making plays with young people here in the town. Uh, I never felt as if I was writing the plays. I actually felt like I was capturing the voices that were telling the stories and then pinning them down into a repeatable form. Um, the, the formula with Shout was to ask them what they wanted to shout about and then work together with them to explore the concerns through drama. And I well remember the very first list. It had the Omar bombing, fox hunting, the IRA, rape, low literacy. Uh, these were the sorts of things the kids wanted to talk about. So, you know, when people are looking for subject matter, uh, one of the uh, first parts of my creative process is always to ask people what they want to say. So I'm always telling a story that wants to be told. And that also ensures that there's a level of interest that sustains me um, throughout. And I need to be passionate about the subject matter in order to sustain me through the length of the project. So alongside, um, you know, exploring child sex abuse, drugs, teenage pregnancy, substance abuse, etc., with young people, I was running a women's theatre group. And we, in contrast, were performing and exploring existing work. And it was when we performed the vagina monologues for the second time that the women said, this is all very well, but this doesn't really talk about our lives. Can we do something ourselves? And we set about doing our bodies ourselves, which we performed in 2005. And as they said, they wanted to look at more than vaginas, which I thought was quite, quite a catchy little strap line there. Anyway, about the same time, I attended the Chainmakers Rally and I heard Tony Benn speaking again, and he was waxing lyrical about the, the big strikes um, of the labour movement, the miners' strike and the docker strike, and he stopped right there, and I was waiting to hear him say, and the steel strike. And at the thought of being left out of labour history, I decided someone needed to tell our story. So I approached the women, put the idea to them, and they were very excited, and that was the genesis of the Women of Steel book. Um, I'm, I made a project of the idea and this was one of the things I put in my abstract was about means to an end. Uh, I didn't know how to get money for any of these projects, but I approached the Workers' Education Association and convinced them that designing a course called Creating um, a Community Drama was, was a great way to bring people from the community in and that's how I paid myself to do the research, the devising and what have you with the, with the women. We got trade unions involved, um, small grant from the council, and eventually a local school had some community, um, community arts money and they paid for the run of the um, a thousand copies when we'd actually got it as far as a book. So um, 
during the course, I was then able to pass on research skills to the women in the VIG group, many of whom had worked at the steelworks or who had families that had worked at the steelworks, which, for those that don't know, um, was the main industry in Corby. And, you know, at one point, one in five people here were Scottish because when they closed the steelworks in uh, Glasgow in the 30s, a lot of people came down for the new steelworks. So um, the women knew what story needed to be told from their own experience, went out and interviewed people and um, we discussed the material and reduced it down and then I was left to write the play. Now that's when I got writer's block big time because I hadn't actually immersed myself in the research matter and I've learned since that I need to immerse and then swim and then imbibe the stories or the lives that I'm writing about and then it, they, those characters speak through me. And that is literally the way it works for me. So until I dived into the research that the women had passed on to me, um, you know, I, I didn't know what, what to do or to say. But I quickly heard those characters speak um, because they were speaking in the voices of my childhood. And the, the women in the street where I grew up, you know, um, would have been... Uh, you know, talking about the same things. They would be on the same shift pattern. We had three shifts going in Corby, we still have. Um, so all of these things were completely normal to me and I knew how the characters would talk. I took the opening scenes along to the first rehearsal and sure enough, um, I was really nervous. I, I thought I'll take notes and then I'll go away and start all over again. But what was wonderful is that once the characters were given voices, they never shut up. And the, the women never made a comment about the writing. Nobody came back and said, actually, Paula, it's a bit long-winded. What about this structure, the tenses, whatever, you know, the, the actual craft of writing. Nothing was ever, uh, I didn't get any help. But what happened is they started talking about the lives and the experiences that those women were conveying. And it grew from there. Um, so... How it became a book is that we performed the first version of this as an outdoor um, site-specific immersive event at the uh, local countryside park, which had um, little uh, museum units where we replaced the models with actresses. And that was how, um, how those women thought plays worked, by the way, that you just keep repeating to a new audience. But I rewrote it for indoor theatre, which meant we could have a... Uh, um, you know, a, a full house at the new theatre that I don't even call me, the Arc Theatre. Um, and then it was filmed. And just to close the project off, I wanted to give the script to the women with the insert of photographs of the, um, you know, the slides that had been being projected during the show. Because in true Banner style, I had made sure that there was a visual script, which is always a complementary and possibly contradictory story that's being told wherever possible um, during any production that, that, that I do, if, if at all possible, I have to say. It's something I like, but it doesn't have to happen. And one of the team said, Paula, that's, that's more than a pamphlet, that's a book. And I said, well, I've never written a book. And after some persuasion, we decided, well, why not? So another part of my creative process is working with a team and gathering around you those who know things that you don't know, and also those who want to learn what you know. Um, and there's lots of graduates in Corby who've come back to the town with no opportunity to apply their talents in an industrial town. And finding uh, Kenny uh, Martin, who was the graphic designer that worked on the project, was just one of the joys of, um, of this sort of thing. So at this point, I'd like to read three of the redundancy monologues uh, from the second act. So if there could be the slides, and I see where I change And Thank you very much, Sonia. So it's 1984, the steelworks is closed. There's mass unemployment, and um, the um, cowboy firms have come to the town to exploit the grants that have come to the town, and the women have been uh, um, employed at a clothing factory, and this is them on their break. I've had a reply from the Miner's Wife Support Group in Castleford, West Yorkshire. They say we can come up next weekend. We'll read it then. Dear sisters, you would be very welcome to come and talk to us about how you have survived since the closure of the steelworks. We're having a do next Saturday, as it looks like both Glass Alton and Lexton Luck Pits are on the hit list for closure. 
Thanks for your support and your kind donations. We're taking the kids to Scarborough on a trip with the money. In solidarity, Susan Perry, Secretary, Castleford Miners Wives Support Group. So we better practice what we want to say. Go on then, you first, Karen. Okay, here we are four years on and where have we got to? Men at home, watching TV or down the pub, being expected to adapt to making the dinner instead of making steel, self-esteem gone, their role as breadwinner, provider, man, changed forever. Whilst we women work all the hours that God sends for some cowboy firm who will just up sticks and move when their subsidy has run out. Jobs for women are plenty. This lot get away with part-time hours and pay us less. Any hint of union organisation and you're out the door. And none of us will fight because we're too desperate to hold down the job. The workers' rights group is leaflessing outside the factories trying to get a foothold. But the unions have been silenced since the works closed. Left out of discussions about bringing jobs to the town. We don't want jobs at any price. We want secure jobs, new jobs, not ones just moved here from anywhere else. The union was a way of life down the works. There was a whole support network and benefits and community, a safety net. Now it's everyone for themselves. I'm all right, Jack. Divide and rule. Come on, Bridie. Well, it's the kids I worry for. By the time they leave school, the whole idea of a proper job, a job for life, comrades, workmates, common trades and skills to bind you together will have gone. Call this progress. It's gone backwards, not forwards. Back to the days of the dockers standing in pens on the docks waiting to be picked for a day's labour. Ah, these new agencies are a rip-off. They get a huge profit for every worker that they send on a 13-week trial. No ties for the employer. And there's no sick pay, holiday pay, maternity pay. No, there's no security. My pal went for an interview at one place for 70 jobs. And they expected you to be available for work at the drop of a hat too. Mind you, there's plenty of work on these new twilight shifts. That's when the kids are in and home from school. And unless your man is on the dole and will watch them while you go out to work, it's back to latchkey kids. The pair of you out working and the kids left to their own devices, bringing themselves up the work. No wonder there's all this drugs and teenage mums. Come on, Jean. Of course, Maggie's started on the miners now. Her and that butcher, Ian McGregor. It'll be the dockers next. Mark my words. We know what it's like to have the guts ripped out of your community. The least we can do is give our support. They were there for us when we needed them. I'm out collecting food for the striking miners most nights and we women have started a committee to bring miners kids here for a holiday. I remember the steel strike as if it was yesterday. And I bet there's the same family battles going on as we had. One man striking and a relative scabbing. There's brothers who still don't speak even now. It's a principle. I can't believe people don't understand the need for solidarity. But I suppose everyone had their own valid reasons for doing what they did. It was hard to manage without any money, despite the food parcels and bags of veg from the wholesalers. I remember my Frank took a parcel round to one striker. Older lady, on her own, no family support. And the following week, we heard she'd killed herself, pulled the electric fire in the bath with her. It's the selfish bastards I don't understand, the ones who never even tried, the boss's darling. I hope the miners realise that redundancy pay, no matter how many noughts they put on the end of it, runs out eventually and you're left with nothing, no industry and no future. And that's me. I'll leave it there, Sonia. 
Thank you, Paula. That's great. And I'm so glad the slideshow went OK in the end. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Brilliant. I'll, I'll take your slides down now and then we'll yeah. jump.